I believe I'm correct in saying that in both ditchings, uh, the pilots were informed via the automatic systems that they'd lost their primary and their reserve oil pumps. Uh, but then when they turned over to emergency oil lubrication, they had a false indication that that had additionally failed. Uh, I know that was brought up as a separate uh, point by the AIB. I'm wondering if you guys can uh, talk anything more about the assurance process there, that when the pilots bail out to the emergency system, they'll get the correct signals back from the emergency systems now as well. Tim, pilot. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that was uh, almost an, an equally exhaustive investigation, uh, investigative procedure as well. Um, there were a number of uh, flaws in that system which hadn't uh, turned up before. Now it's been thoroughly investigated. Uh, all of the issues are understood. We've got a whole... Sp this is actually one of the modifications which is going into the aircraft prior to, to flight. Is uh, almost a, a whole new emergency lubrication system. So there are you know, new pumps, valves, there's new um, sort of printed circuit boards to, uh, as part of the, you know, the, the electronics determining um, the pressures and all, all, all the different parts of the, of the system. The whole thing has been reviewed. Uh, there's, a different, uh, there's a much better test regime now, so we'll be testing these systems on the ground more effectively so that we can prove that they work. Um, so yeah, the whole, the whole system has been completely overhauled. Uh, what is good to know is that although the pilots got a false indication to say that the, the system wasn't working, uh, in fact it actually was. Um, and as a result of it working, the, uh, the gearboxes that were recovered from the aircraft that ditched were actually in very good condition. There was no wear or uh, deterioration from the fact that the, the oil pumps had stopped working. So the emergency lubrication system worked as it was supposed to do. It just uh, The light that shouldn't have come on uh, to tell the pilots that it uh, it was working came on to tell them that it wasn't working and that's that was a, a fundamental flaw. Yeah, but in that regard, um, if the pilot had a positive indication that his emergency system was working, would that have driven him to divert rather than to ditch at sea immediately? Um, yes, if the if the M loop system had worked as uh, as it should have done, then uh, the crew at that time because this failure didn't, uh, didn't exist, we didn't know about it. Uh, it would just been considered as, a, as an oil pump failure. Uh, the crew had 30 minutes to, uh, to fly at a, re at a reduced power uh, to, to land potentially somewhere other than, than ditch in the sea. I mean, it could be unlucky and be more than 30 minutes flying time from anything you could land on, but in both of these particular insta instances, they could have either landed on shore or on a, on a heli deck. Any other questions? Um, I just thinking there's a, a lot of talk about you know removing the oil, uh, sorry, the removing the oil, removing the water, um, and so on. But with all these checks, usually when you make differences, there's consequences. So with all these checks, are we exposing the gearbox um, to the elements in the hangar on the shop floor, therefore running the risk of introducing contaminants, contamination, you know, air airborne particulate, and so on. Because things like that can create sludge as well. Um, maybe we're not introducing the, the parts of the gearbox that aren't normally introduced daily day. I'm not hearing anything about filtration, for example, checking out you know, um, contaminant within, within the oil. Is that an issue that's being then looked at? Uh, well, it's not. The, the, the oil is examined regularly anyway. Uh, but where the... Uh, access to the gearbox um, to do these inspections is actually the uh, the main sealed part of the gearbox so it's not one of the bits that uh, it's one of the, it's one of the areas that is awash with oil so you know moisture isn't going to be an issue in there anyway uh, we're not actually looking at the inside of the shaft we're looking at uh, the ultrasonic is done from the outside of the shaft uh, looking in through the through the thickness so it's a, it's a different part of the gearbox and We've done quite a few of them now, uh, and it's you have to you know, disconnect some couplings to the gearbox and then reconnect them. Um, there's one which is uh, more important than the other one, but again, this isn't something that would show up in flight. This is something that shows up during the, the pre-flight start checks. So we've got a, a very robust system uh, whereby the, uh, the engineers will... Uh, in fact, it's a triple check they're going to be doing to make sure everything's been reassembled and is how it should be. Um, but if that was, for some reason, missed, 
or there was something not quite right, it, again, it shows up on the ground. It's not, it doesn't show up in the air. It's just a, it would just be a, an expensive mistake because there's, there's, there's a chance of uh, uh, potentially damaging the uh, one of the one of the actuators. So it's you know, it's not a safety issue. It uh, would be an expense issue for the helicopter operator. Can I just add something? The, the barrier that's the ultrasonic. So the, the, the only real, let's say, invasive barrier, which is minimalist ultrasonics, and actually that was changed because that was originally an eddy current test, and all three helicopters that we have in the room, uh, and, and certainly Eurocopter themselves, realised that that, as an invasive process, was far, far too onerous and introduces the risk exactly as you've talked about it. So the pushback from y your helicopter operators and uh, to Eurocopter was, we need something simpler, less invasive, more accurate, that we can do as part of a regular maintenance routine, and that's why we have, why we have ultrasonics, because it reduces that risk considerably. So it's purely as a result of exactly that question. So we, so we, we think we've addressed it. Okay. Any other questions? Chaz. Thanks. It was just a um, clarification. I think Tim said that the CEA gave approval based on the operators performing the, the immediate solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, have all the operators done that, or what's the time scale for it? Tim. <laughs> uh, I imagine everybody everybody has done it, or is working through it. Uh, I can only speak for, for Bristow, as we're working through it. We have our, I think our first aircraft will be complete and ready for testing, I think it's either tomorrow or the day after. Um, so we're, we're working through the process. There's, it's actually quite complicated. I mentioned these service bulletins uh, that came out from from Eurocopter, they actually amount to nearly 250 pages of text, an awful lot of which are the uh, the task cards for installing all the modifications. So it's uh, it's not an overnight thing. It takes several days per aircraft to, to fit all the new parts. And then, of course, there's a, a testing phase that we put them through to make sure everything's working as it should do. So that's, the, that's where we are at the moment. We're working through that process. And then are you working with all the operators to make sure that's all done before they're all clear for flying? Or how they, 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 so we don't have to do that. That's part of the normal process. So we don't have to regulate that. That's part of the civil aviation yeah. kind of and an airworthiness certification. That's so, now effectively law. Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess for the workforce, the, for reassurance, getting on an aircraft that's had the immediate solutions done, how are they going to know? Are they going to be told when they're checking in that this one has had the immediate solutions, the one you're getting on hasn't? You won't be flying in one that hasn't. Yeah, it, it, it can't. It, it, can't it can't show up if it doesn't illegal. have it. Yeah. It's really simple. You know, if, if if these barriers have not been implemented, it won't be on the tarmac. It'll still be in the hangar. It's really as simple as that. Any other questions? No. Can I just so Sir, let's, can I just see if there yeah. is any other questions yeah. that maybe people are a wee bit apprehensive about asking then the information sheets, the fact sheets, the cards and everything are there. Get in touch with us on a one-to-one -one basis if you want to, to have a conversation. Um, that's what the, the HSSG is here for, to try and assist you collectively and on an individual basis to, to build your confidence in these machines. Yeah. I mean, we've tried to be as open and transparent as we can over the last nine months. I absolutely am first to say that we haven't always got it 100% right, but... Uh, in terms of continuing to learn, we've got an evaluation. So there are three more or two more sessions today. So your feedback today will help us make the next two sessions better. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of push back the responsibility to you in terms of how can you help us help your colleagues, you know, and, and you know, what, what have we done well today? What do we need to learn and, and you know, to feed back into the next groups? So I'd really appreciate your feedback. And as you say, if there are any concerns, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you've got HSSG's email address, you've got John Taylor from Unite, and you've got Jake's email address, you know, get in touch, let us know what's, you know, what's being done, what the mood is, and everything else. We know confidence has been dealt it. We know that, and, and we didn't need a survey to do that. We needed a survey to understand how better we need to communicate with you. So that, that was the purpose of the survey that got, so, you know, so much media, you know. You know, any one of us could have understood that there was an impact. 
But what came out of that was what more we had to do in terms of openness, transparency, who had to be in the room, and the level of alignment that you required. And we hope we've tried to show that today. But if you have any concerns, please, any one of the four of us will be around and come and see us privately as well. Also, Les, when you mentioned the trade unions, there's British Airline Pilots Association, yeah. Derek Watling, representative, sits on HSSG. And just to supplement that as well, he has been involved with the pilots who have had sessions like this with the with Eurocopter and their, their employers. Pretty gruelling sessions, I believe, for Eurocopter, according to the Pilots Association. Um, and they've come through that as well. And I would also emphasise, if at any time during the process of checking in, you're concerned, time out for safety, lads. I want to speak to the pilot. I want a wee bit more assurance. And that will be provided as well. OK. So thanks very much for showing up. It's really appreciated. Uh, safe home, I guess. Take care.